Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Draw your attention to the back of your bulletins for the announcements printed there. Uh, just to highlight that there is Bible study following worship. We'll uh, have fellowship. Uh, all are welcome to fel our fellowship time downstairs. Um, and then after a little bit, we'll gather together uh, toward the end of that and do our Bible study. Um, you members, you can see if you're interested on October 1st, uh, we'll make that part of our Bible study. Um, and then uh, just a couple of prayer concerns. Certainly we lift up, uh, there's been some major natural disasters in uh, Libya and Morocco. Um, uh, multiple huge death counts in both cases, unfortunately. So we lift up uh, those uh, events in our prayers. Uh, Darlene Mueller, her surgery went well, uh, still in the hospital, but will hopefully be transferred to the care center in uh, Osceola on tomorrow on Monday. Um, any other? We'll, we'll start with Wendy back there. Cousin Linda? Okay. And you wanted to say something, Gail? Yeah. It's good to be back. And I want to thank Jeff and Marion for all their support and loving care and helping with my health needs before and after surgery. In fact, Dad, I even let her last week give me a shower. <laughs> and I'm the and gal. Said, well, we tell about it. <laughs> I'm the gal back in high school that refused to take showers and flunk gym. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big step for me. <laughs> but if it wasn't for this church and the people in it, and Deb and Marion, Pastor. Dwight called me, Rose called me. I mean, it just uh, happens to <coughs> And bless you all. There's our mission moment for the day, right? Yes. There you go. Excellent, excellent. Good. Are there other announcements or bird concerns? See, how's uh, Pete Lindbergh's wife doing? She's home? That's a good question. Yeah, Donna uh, went home, uh, I don't remember when this week, but she's home and uh, it seems to be doing good. Yep, thanks. I'd like to welcome Carol Johnson back. She has moved to the townhouses in, uh, on the other side of, of church and it's good to have her back. She's been a long time member from Time of Peace. Great. Good. Good to hear. Excellent. If not, let's turn to page one of our bulletins and join in the confession and forgiveness printed there. As you are in there, please stand as we join together in that. Blessed by God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. 
in Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Our opening hymn is Let the Whole Creation Cry, 876. 876.
God of promise. Abraham scoffed and Sarah laughed when they were told of your plans for them and their family. Yet you remained faithful to your promise and gave them a son, Isaac. Help us to trust in your promises for our lives and to live according to your will. Amen. Please be seated. first reading is Psalm 105, and we will read it responsibly. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan, and to your portion for inheritance. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, The second reading is Genesis chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. <coughs> Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. <laughs> the Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. You girls like to come up for a story? So uh, we just 
heard a story in the prayer earlier, and the psalm even talked about a man named Abraham and his wife Sarah. And uh, God called Abraham to be uh, the beginning of a kind of a new nation and said, if you, I'm going to make some promises to you, and you go to this land. So he gathered all his family, and they uh, went on like a long camping trip, well, almost. Uh, but they were going to a new home in a new land. And so that's kind of the story that we're going to be in. But in the midst of that, it, there's this story of God making some promises to Abraham. What do you see up? What are all those things? Stars, right? And he's looking up at all the stars. That's part of the promise here. It says, God came to Abraham and made a promise. Abraham, you are very special to me. I will take care of you and give you lots of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But Abraham asked God many times, are you sure? I don't have any children yet. God thought Abraham needed some more something more to help him understand. So God took Abraham outside and showed him the night sky. Your family will include as many people as there are stars in the sky, God told Abraham. Have you ever looked at stars in the sky? There's a lot of them out there, aren't there? That's a pretty big promise that God's going to make Abraham have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren as many as the stars in the sky. That's amazing. Abraham stared up at all those stars. He couldn't believe, to, he couldn't begin to count all those twinkling lights, stars and stars and stars all around him. Abraham looked up at the stars and saw God at work. Abraham believed God. Now for another promise, said God to Abraham, I will, you will need a place for your huge family to live. I will give you the land I, uh, that I promised. Are you sure, God? Abraham asked. God made a covenant or a promise with Abraham, a promise that Abraham would become a father and a grandfather and a great-great-grandfather and a great-great-great-grandfather uh, and on and on. And all Abraham's many, many sons, daughters, grandsons, and great-granddaughters would live with God in the land in which Abraham stood. So that's the promise. Look at all those people. It just seems like it's reminding us that it goes way back. A lot of people, right? So those are two of three promises. And I'll tell you about a third in just a little bit. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that as you promise, make promises to Abraham, you make promises to us as well. That you love us and care for us. And that you are with us always. Help us to believe and trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, you guys, for coming up. Don't you love that sound of feet? <laughs> Last week, we did a little comparison between the two creation stories in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. Uh, and we were reminded that it's not so much how as about who, right? It's not how God created, because we heard two quite distinct creation stories. So they seem quite different. So how God did it doesn't really make a difference, although people get kind of freaked out about that, right? It's much more who did it, that God did it, that God created us and everything around us. That's the important message out of both of those stories. And in that second creation story, we were also reminded a little bit about who each of us is. It reminds us that you are wonderfully and beautifully created as a child of God. That's important to remember. But you also have a job to do along with that. We, were, we heard that in that story, that we are to be stewards of all that God has given to us, that we are responsible for God's creation, and we should not take that job lightly, <coughs> or the, that vocation lightly is the word I used last week. And with that, we also need to hear that in the midst of all of that, we are not alone, that we are in this together, but we also have our Ebenezer, our rock-solid God, who is with us always. That was the message that came out of that passage. So then, having left off last week, 
with Adam and Eve naked in the garden, as it were, uh, there's a lot that's happened up to this story then of Abraham and Sarah. So let's do a little catching up uh, and fill in a few parts of that story from there to here uh, so we can put into context uh, what today's story, where that is. So after these creation stories, the next four stories in Genesis, chapters 3 through 11, uh, after Adam and Eve start out, uh, and then it goes through the Tower of Babel, there's four stories. Uh, each of those stories, and I've, I've talked to you a little bit about this before, but in each of those four stories, there is a pattern. There is uh, a pattern that recurs in each of those stories. It looks like this. There's a pattern of, there's a sin that is committed. God has a judgment as a result of that sin. And then God's providential hand comes upon uh, the people and cares for them in some way. We call it grace. So there's this pattern. Sin, judgment, grace. Sin, judgment, grace. Let's look quickly at those four stories and so you can see that pattern play out. So Adam and Eve, after they're created, they, get, uh, they, they have the garden there. What do they do? What's their sin? Whatever. They eat the fruit. It's not an apple. It's a forbidden fruit. We don't know what it is. We think it's a weed. Anyway. Uh, but they eat the forbidden fruit. That's the, uh, that's the sin. What's the judgment? <laughs> they get booted out of the garden, right? And they're told they're going to die. Um, that's the judgment. What's the grace? The grace is that God... <laughs> provides them with clothing. God covers them in animal skins and takes the, the harshness of that kind of a way. And judgment grace. All right, in the next story, we have then Cain and Abel that uh, up here. What's the sin? Murder. Murder. Cain kills Abel. The judgment is that Cain is banished uh, from God's presence, uh, kind of as, a, as, a, as it says. But God also then puts a mark on Cain, his, God's grace, in a way so that others actually won't harm Cain, that he is cared for and uh, keeps him safe and alive. Then we get to the flood story, uh, the third of the four stories. Here the sin is that all the people are bad. <laughs> it's not just a few, but it says all the people are bad. Um, and the judgment, of course, is the... Blood, very good. And the grace is that Noah and his family are saved uh, and they're spared along with. Then there is this promise that comes in the form of the rainbow uh, and God promises God will never do this again. Finally, we have the story of the Tower of Babel. Here, the sin is that the people were building this tower for a purpose. And that purpose was to do what? Get up to God. So that they could be like God. They could take control. That's the sin. And the judgment is what? God says, uh -uh, not going to happen. Scatters them in all kinds of different languages. Disperses them, right? That's the judgment. The grace. It's not there. There's this cliffhanger hanging at the end of chapter 11. What's God going to do? Right? Beautiful, beautiful, poetic style in all of this. It's just wonderful. Where's the grace? Well, chapter 12, again, there weren't chapter numbers in the, in the Old Testament, in the original Hebrew writing, but in the next story, we hear God saying to Abraham, Abraham, I got a plan. You're going to be my grace. You're going to be the means through which the brokenness of my creation is going to be mended, or somewhat mended. And he uses Abraham uh, to help make God known in the midst of all the suffering and sin that's been going on. There's the grace. And then God makes a covenant with Abraham. We heard part of that covenant. There, uh, there are three parts to it, actually, not the two that you heard in the children's version. That happens in chapter 12. You hear that covenant made again in chapter 17. Uh, it is uh, restated. But the covenant, those three promises are that I'm going to give you land, the promised land, the milk of, land of milk and honey, right? 
And then I'm going to give you descendants as many as stars in the sky or grains of sand on the sea, right? I mean, that's a lot of people. Um, big promises. The third promise is kind of hidden in some ways, and we like to hide it, other than the first part. God says, I will bless you. That's a great thing. We all love being blessed, but the problem is we take that blessed as in, I'm going to be prosperous. I'm going to receive all of God's blessings. Problem is, we fail to hear the last part of that blessing. I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to all the nations of the world. We love to forget the last part. <laughs> As did the people of Israel of old. That, that's the tension that's always there in the old uh, First Testament. <clears throat> Uh, we simplify, I like to simplify that, it's not me who formed this, but blessed to be a blessing, you've heard that. We hear it at Thanksgiving, right, all the time. But that's really what that, uh, where, where that is coming from. Blessed to be a blessing, and important for us to remember. And amazingly, Abraham hears that promise, hears God's call, and follows it. And he uproots his family from the region of Ur and goes to the promised land, goes to the land of Canaan, Israel. Now, think about something in the midst of all of this. Who were Abraham and his parents worshiping prior to this? You may not have caught it, but it says they were worshiping other gods. They were worshiping little statues they put on their windowsills so that the crops would grow and it would rain. They were not worshiping the God of our, of creation, of those stories that we heard before. Not God. Again, the point being that it is all God's doing. It is God acting. It is God who is the major actor and the hero of this love story. All of this comes by God's grace. Not by Abraham, even though he's very faithful in many ways. It's not because of Abraham's faithfulness or goodness. It is because of God. And that translates then to us too, right? It's not because we're good enough or we've earned this, that we deserve God's love and grace. No, we simply receive it because of God's love and grace. And the reality that we hear in all these stories is that life with God isn't always easy, right? And Abraham discovers that because Abraham is put to the test over and over between his call and where we are today. Um, I mean, think about the challenges of the promises that God has made to Abraham up to this point. Uh, Abraham rolls into Egypt one day and uh, he realizes that the Pharaoh is kind of taking a fancy to Sarah. And what do you do if you're the Pharaoh, the, the prince of Egypt, <laughs> and you want something? You just take it, exactly. And what do you do with Sarah's husband, presumed husband? Well, you kill him. That's what you do. So Abraham knows this, and so he's, ah, uh, this isn't going to work so well. I'm going to bond Sarah off as my sister, so the Pharaoh doesn't kill me. Now that's a half truth or a half lie, however you want to take it, because Sarah actually was his half sister. All right, the good old days. Um, anyway, it'll get better here in a minute. Don't worry. Um, now, so there's a little challenge. How do you have children if you don't have a wife? If the Pharaoh's taking your wife, it's hard to have children as many as the stars in the heavens, right? All right. Then there's the reality that Sarah's, uh, 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 Sarah's barren, which makes it, again, hard to have descendants. Um, and then they try to take things into their own hands by having Abraham uh, have a child with Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden, in the good old days. Um, and now a whole situation doesn't work out too well. Then there's Lot and Abraham. Lot um, is related. I can't, um, what is it, brother? No, but I, I'm blanking. But anyway, sorry about that. But they're they're having uh, they they realize they can't. Their families have grown, and Lot and Abraham can't manage together. And so Abraham says, Lot, I'll give you the choice. You have the Jordan River Valley, or you can have uh, Israel, the the main part of Israel there. Um, and Lot says.
says, I'll take the river valley. It'd be nice over the desert, right? I mean, it makes more sense. Um, and But, I mean, think about that. How can God's promise be fulfilled that God gives Abraham the land if he doesn't have it, if it's not his anymore? So all these tests. Uh, and then, I mean, as we're getting near to this story, the reality is Abraham and Sarah are, as the saying goes, no spring chickens anymore, right? <laughs> um, and they're well beyond childbearing years. I mean, this whole story is steeped in suspense and intrigue. What, what's going to happen? How is it ever going to be possible for God's promises to be fulfilled? I mean, it's just, it's just thick with it, right? So that's a little background leading up to this scene where these three men, a.k.a. God, dressed in uh, three men, kind of a Trinitarian maybe view, if you will, it doesn't come off quite that way, but you might take it that way. They come to Mamre, where Abraham has set up temporary residence. Abraham, in good Middle East fashion, is very hospitable. Hospitable. He welcomes them uh, and starts to feed them. Right? I mean, it's like the, any, any grandmother, right? Come have something to eat, right? And what happens then? You're down for a six-course meal, right? Um, and so, all in, after eating, the promise then is restated by one of these travelers. Uh, it says, he says to Abraham, I will surely return. I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. So the promise is restated. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but I like the inclusion of Sarah in that he could have just said, you're going to have a son, Abraham. But uh, the fact that there's, Sarah's mentioned in this, included in that culture, I mean, being a woman, it wouldn't have needed to be there, but it was, and I like that. But anyway, um, uh, I'm not sure, it, you know, it fits with that culture. Um, when I got home last week, my daughter said, because uh, I was talking about Eve, uh, you know, and, and not being subordinate to Adam, and she goes, do you really think the authors thought about it that way? And I went, probably not. But I think theologically it fits better. I think God was thinking that way, so I'm right either way. Anyway. Uh, uh, sorry about that. But, I, um, but I, I think that's true. And I, I, you know, I want to bring that up because I think it's important that because it's very easy and, and it has happened over generations. You know, this is women's place or these are these people's place because the Bible says so. Well, we have to, I think we have to look deeper uh, in all of that. Anyway, all right. Um, so as you well know, as she hears that message, what happens? She's standing behind the curtain, and she laughs. She giggles, understandably, right? I mean, she's old. And there's even a little sexual humor in here. If you can hear it, it says, shall I have pleasure in my old age? She's not talking just about the glow of pregnancy. Um, so anyway, the response here is, uh, is profound. God says through these three, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And what's the intended response? No, of course not. Nothing is beyond God's ability. Nothing is too wonderful for the Lord. Indeed, that is the case as we hear then that Isaac is born to Abraham and Sarah. And remember, the name Isaac means literally laughter. So he's named after what Sarah did. So the question or the point that kind of stuck with me, grabbed me this week is, do we ever laugh at God? <laughs> do we ever laugh at God? Do we ever think that it's impossible for God to... Fill us with joy. Or that God would care for us as deeply as it appears that God cares for the people in Scripture. I, I sometimes at times wonder, how can you keep loving me, God? Do you ever think that? I mean, you know God. You know me. You know what I've done, what I think. It would be easy to think that God would give up on us because... It's easy for us to give up on each other at times. 
But thankfully, God doesn't do so. God has not left us alone. God is always there hovering us with grace. As we hear it in those, that pattern, sin, judgment, grace, God somehow clothes us, puts us in situations that reconnect us with God. Indeed, there is nothing that is too wonderful for our God. All things are possible, Paul writes, through him who loved us, right? Who loves us. Certainly that is true um, as the story continues throughout Scripture, right? I mean, ultimately, we are given the ultimate gift uh, of fulfillment of God's promise as we enter into the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who dies, rises, uh, dies and uh, rises for our sake. Right? I mean, that is the ultimate expression of uh, God's love and grace. And we, in a way, can laugh at that, can't we? <laughs> can laugh because God is so deeply, uh, so deeply cares and loves us. Um, I think we also can step back if we really think about it and laugh at the wow of God's creation, of the relationships that we have with one another. Certainly, again, we can laugh, uh, and, as it were, laugh at the resurrection because the, as, we, uh, as we were singing our hymn of praise, uh, this is the feast of what? Victory. Victory for our God. The reality is that the end of the love story is that God wins. Right? Because of God, because God wins, you win. You are given that promise of new life now and forever. And because of that, we can live in joy and hope and laughter. You see, the wonder of this story is that God truly is faithful. God is faithful. God fulfills God's promises. God is a God of love. God is your God of mercy. God fills you with grace. Thankfully, God has the last half. Amen.
Titus and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as found on page 4 of your bulletin. Together we profess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray then for the church, all of God's creation, and all who are in need, as we pray for our neighbors and friends. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for your church. Bless the missions and ministries of diverse congregations that they uplift, uplift the good news of salvation in ways that can be understood. Merciful God, we see our prayer. We pray for your creation. Send rain to lands experiencing drought and healing to rivers clogged with pollution. Enrich the soil for trees and plants. Protect the crops needed to feed those who hunger. Merciful God, we see our prayer. We pray for all who govern. Encourage those in positions of power to lead with empathy, practice forgiveness, and care for those who struggle. Merciful God, we see our prayer. We pray for our neighbors who face illness of any kind, for those strained financially, for all living with chronic pain, mental illness, the disease of addiction, or otherwise afraid or in harm's way. Protect all who cry out for mercy. We pray especially today for Donna and Darlene and others we have on our prayer list. We pray for the people of Morocco and Libya, and there's so many other places in the world that are suffering. We lift them all into your care, we pause now in silence to lift those as well as others we know to be in need as we pause now in silence. Provide the aid that is needed, the comfort and the care that is needed. Surround them in your loving care. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for our congregation here. Open our hearts to practice intentional invitation. Help us to forgive each other, practice patience, and choose welcome over judgment. Move us to care for those in our community seeking refuge and safety. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give you thanks for the saints who have died in faith. Show us how to live faithfully, creatively, and lovingly in your church and in the world around us. Merciful God, we see our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This time we receive our offer.
pray, God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We join in our communion liturgy on the next page. We have come to share in the table that Jesus has prepared for us. Through Jesus dying and rising for us, he has taken our sin and We are here to celebrate that good news and to experience Christ's presence with us. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might eat for the world with signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day.
May this, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your bank, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Go, my children, with my blessing. 543, 543. <coughs>